of the path catches and mirrors back countless other pieces of the path. I spent a lot of time tuning into ethics, known as Sila and Kali. The three stages along the Eightfold Path, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Growing up, I received messages that it was okay to screw other people over to get ahead. This ethos ran deep, and I had to and continue to do a lot of undoing and behavioral remodeling work. I don't waste the suffering that can be transmuted when I am tempted to or act in an unskillful way and catch myself. I check how my body and heart feel, noted, and investigate those qualities. I also try not to beat myself up and instead practice self-compassion. And when I choose a skillful action, I feel into the gratitude and joy, how it emerges in my body, and I try to expand that. A big part of staying sober has also been handling loss. A Dash. PLE years ago, my ex-partner died from addiction. They weren't only my ex-partner, but they were one of my strongest recovery inspirations when I was in early sobriety. Together we founded the group that would lack dash her become recovery dharma NYC. I am still taking advice they share when we were in each other's lives. And I'm heartbroken that the full up Escaping with substances overpowered their ability to take one of their own pieces of advice that they gave me after they started using again is much easier to stay sober than to get sober. They told me they struggled with presenting as trans feminine in the world while sober, the free dash twenty fronts of harassment, rage rudeness, and microaggressions were heavy to handle. As a trans-masculine person, I have experienced much of this myself, and I know that transphobia is amplified against trans-feminine people. I'm also grateful that myself and many other trans and gender Diverse people have found continued strength and clarity in sobriety and support from our practices and networks to keep going. I love you. Keep going. This is a meta phrase that was passed down from a Dharma teacher years back, one that appears often in my read. Dash. Flexions. I, like all beings, I'm deserving of love, including my own love. It all starts there. I will persist and resist the narratives and attacks against trans people, especially in this time when there is an intensely targeted political attack on our existence. I am training to face reality and to see it for what it is. Here are some snapshots of my practice. Every day, I sit down to meditate. Maybe it's 45 minutes, or 5 minutes, or somewhere in between. I heard a teacher once say that even just paying attention to one breath counts. After I met, Dad, I take, I recite the five remembrances, or listen to monks chanting them. In a video online, I am of the nature to grow old, there is no escaping growing old. I am of the nature to get sick, there is no escaping sickness. I am of the nature to die, there is no escaping death. Everyone and everything I love are of the nature to change, and there is no escaping separation from them. My actions are my only belongings, 
I cannot escape their consequences, they are the ground upon which I stand. Next I recite one round of classic metaphrases. I close my sit with taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I build on my daily sitting and light practice with residential crack. Dash. Tice periods. I do at least one 7 to 10 day silent meditation retreat per year. This year I did my first meta retreat, and it was incredibly fruitful plus. Spend a week at a Thai forest Buddhist monastery. I'm grateful for that. Opportunities for these extended, dedicated practice periods, and belief that they have contributed immensely to expanding and strengthening wisdom, balance, and heartfulness. I'm still continuing to identify impermanence. Anicca, un, dash, governability, anatta, and unsatisfactoriness. Yuga, and the ways in which I relate to them, and I don't doubt that these will be lifelong tasks. But I'm seeing them a lot more, and clearer, and this naturally has made recovery more attainable, and intoxication much less desirable. Escaping doesn't lead to lasting happiness, in fact in my experience, it just prolongs and sometimes solidifies whatever I'm trying to get away from. The Bene, Dash. Hits of being in touch with these three marks of existence are many, in, Dash. Priest appreciation and presence, awareness of the vast webs and chains, of interdependence, and a letting be of things being what I want and how. I want them. Recovery Dharma has kept me rooted and rejoicing. You can read another iteration of my story in the Transcending Trans Buddhist Voices Anthology Singing Content Warning Suicide I found Recovery Dharma during the lowest and most trans Dash Formative time of my life the popsicle sticks and glue that I used to contain my overwhelm and despair came crashing down around me. I later learned to refer to these popsicle sticks as substance use and process addiction, and that my overwhelm was rooted in untreated depression and trauma. Looking back on my recovery journey, I am grateful for that experience, learning, and healing, but it was hard earned. My story starts in kindergarten, when I immigrated with my parents. Overnight, my world changed, a foreign place with a new language, knowing almost no one, a new school where I couldn't under dash stand anybody, and my parents working all the time to survive. They did their best, but an asleep parent wasn't a present parent, and I had to learn independence from a young age. I grew up seeing my parents' model working hard, sacrificing their needs, acting strong, and never talking about feelings. I learned that my role in the family was to study hard, to not be a burden with my needs, push down my feelings, and that I needed to be happy for that. Their sacrifices were worth it. By high school, I've been pushing down tears and insecurities for years. I was doing well in school, and that came with some self-worth and external validation, but I also felt so alone. The closer friendships I developed were always cut short by one of us moving away. So I entered high school with no real friends but luckily got adopted 
by an extrovert who I shared a geography class with. Finding some friends slowly built some confidence, but even in that circle, I felt like I was on the periphery, overthinking and worried. Dash. Being that I wasn't good enough, attractive enough, cool enough to have friends. But I got by, pushing down those insecurities. Later in high school, I found myself with people who had access to weed, and when I smoked, the incessant chatter in my mind cleared. I could be in on the secret and didn't have to worry about being uncool for once because he needs dash. Everything was just hilarious instead. But when I was living my usual sober life as a straight-laced nerd, I was fraught with social anxiety and low self-esteem. The next times of my life were fueled by fear and external validation. I started to gain the external markers of success. I graduated top of my class, attracted Roman. Dash. Tick partners, got a coveted job, moved into a condo in the city. On the outside, things were great, but inside I was frightened constantly that the perfect facade would crack and everyone would see me as a fraud. I fell into coping mechanisms, working constantly and seeking perfection. Because if I was perfect then the fear of not being good enough felt a little less intense. On evenings to treat myself for the shitty life I put up with. I'd smoke weed from the moment I walked through the door until I eventually passed out in a smoke-filled oblivion, and every weekend was wake and bake. I was living only for the weekends, going to raves and festivals, taking party drugs and chasing the serotonin highs and feelings of connectedness that made me feel something other than the depression and anxiety that plagued my work days. I started going to work high and my roommates and close friends started to tell me that they were worried about me. Honestly, I was worried about me too. During a particularly stressful time at work, I went on vacation and came home wondering why I was staying in a job I hated. I'm poor too. Dash. Nate that I had saved up some money, and so I quit without a job line. Up and decided I was going to travel. Surely my location was the problem. And if I traveled to beautiful destinations, then I would be happy. I was. Leaving on a trip to try to outrun my anxiety and depression, and maybe find some key to happiness because other solutions to stress, like mine, dash, fullness, hadn't worked for me. I now understand that with the unresolved trauma, my mind was a place that lacked self-compassion and my body felt unsafe when I sat still. It felt like such serendipity when I was struck by the idea that some people turn to religion in times of uncertainty and fear, so my day. Dash. Inspiration turned me to giving my parents Buddhist religion a try. Up to this point, I had been an adamant atheist, though I always obeyed when my parents wanted me to go with them to the nearby Buddhist temple. I didn't understand why we lit incense, bowed three times in front of statues of deities I didn't recognize, and prayed with offerings. 
for good things or for bad things not to happen. It all just seemed like illogical superstition to me. Now that I opened my mind to the idea of Buddhism, I learned about the Theravada and Mahayana traditions in Southeast Asia, and they spoke to me so much more than my parents' practices. I searched online for a beginner intro to Buddhism and found Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo's book, Into the Heart of Life, and Serendipi. Dash. Tusli again, her preface felt like it spoke directly to me as I was preparing for my trip. I highlighted a passage about how the mind is always with us with its thoughts and fears from which we can never escape and so it makes sense to try and work with our mind so that it becomes a friendly travel companion for our journey through life. I dove into the book and became aware of the truth of Imper. Dash. Manance and the truth of suffering. It resonated with me so deeply that the Buddha never demanded people to blindly follow his teachings, but instead encouraged them to observe for themselves and see that what he taught was true. And while impermanence and suffering made sense, I couldn't wrap my head around non-attachment or no self, so I was deterred. Dash. Mind to learn about it on my trip. That's how I ended up volunteering in Thailand, though I can't say I learned too much about these Buddhist concepts in Thailand because of the language barrier. However, I did meet some incredibly kind monks and lay people. It was true though that no matter how far I went, my mind was always with me. It was telling me that I'm not good enough, that I'm weak since I burned out, and that I'm a broken depressed person who will never be happy if I couldn't even be perfectly happy while seeing these beautiful sights. I'm really glad to say that I have a much healthier Rella. Dash. Tianship with my thoughts and emotions today with the help of lots of therapy, my recovery and recovery dharma, and my growing meditation practice. I eventually grew homesick and came home. I found a corporate job and started living with my now spouse. We abused we together ev. Dash. Every day, and as my job got more stressful, my weed use increased. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I was a shell of a person, reclosed into myself by overwhelm at work and even more overwhelmed by basic things. Like going to the grocery store. I would later come to realize that the drastic shift in the world overnight as well as the panic about the unknown was emotionally tricked. Dash. Hearing my trauma around immigrating at such a young age, I think I experienced emotional flashbacks of my terror and reverted to my kin. Dash. Their garden psychological capacity, except this time, I had me to abuse to try to quell the overwhelming panic. And it worked for a while, until it didn't anymore. I started down into the worst episode of depression I ever experienced. I lost interest in friends, hobbies, and my partner, and I shut down. It was really scary when I lost the ability to concentrate in. My work performance declined, especially scary as someone who self work came from work. As my overwhelm and terror grew, I turned to leave during the work day too and I hated myself for it. 
I entered a cycle of panic, losing, feeling a few minutes of relief, and then hating myself for being weak for giving into the craving. The height of my addiction, or my metaphorical bottom, pain. When I lost the will to live, my attempt on my life luckily ended with me in the emergency room. I was admitted to inpatient treatment and detox from marijuana while attending group therapy and learned the powerful feeling of connection when someone says, me too. I had start, dash, and therapy about a year before. Because I was high all the time, I wasn't mindful of my thoughts and feelings outside of therapy sessions. So progress was slow. I left inpatient treatment with a waiting list spot for an outpatient program, a recommendation that I give up marijuana and attend psychologist follow-up sessions. I remember being pulled back. Depression was a three-song combination of bio, psycho, social, and that I would need to address bio with medication, psycho with therapy, and social by building up a mental well-being support system. For social support, I found my way to the rooms of marijuana. Anonymous where I heard other people telling stories that were similar to mine and it really helped me to stay off the lead. But the singleness of purpose, tradition and 12 step felt stifling because my problem wasn't only marijuana use, it was also the trauma I was unearthing in the side. Again I come back to serendipity. The recovery dharma program was exactly what I needed at the time. I received a suggestion to attend a second recovery meeting on a day that I had already been to it. And a meeting, and curious, I went searching for alternatives. Through the Buddhist Recovery Network website, I found free. Recovery Dharma. When I visited the website, I was delighted to find that the Recovery Dharma book was readily available for free on the website. That it was accessible to me in my time of need. I devoured the book. Quickly, it helped me to frame my addiction in the teachings of the Buddha that I had already developed an interest in. Now revisiting the Dharma with my new lived experience of addiction, the truth of suffer. Dash. Ing took on new meaning. I found a Sangha that met almost daily. And almost every day, I came and sat in meditation with like-minded travelers on the path. We could talk about anything without the restrictions of singleness of pure dash so it was exactly what i needed because it helped me learn to meditate with the safety of a group and i learned the language of talking about my trauma from reading the trauma informed road book listening to shares and practicing during my own shares Today I feel like I'm thriving, not merely surviving. I've been sober from my drug of no choice for almost three years, and I've made great progress managing my process addictions of workaholism and perfectionism. I'm practicing real self-love, gratitude, meditation, and Validating my own feelings, my family, friends, and work are all going better than ever before. I can be present for my loved ones. I am able to 
Take care of my darling cat and accept her love. I'm able to give back by hosting meetings in service of my Sangha. I'm also blessed to be able to volunteer my professional skills as an Ardney Global Board member and serve on board committees. I have cultivated an understanding of myself, my trauma, tricks, dash, furs and coping mechanisms, so that I can weather the emotional storms when they come and give myself loving kindness. There is hope and joy in my life, as well as strength and security in knowing that although I can't carpet the whole world, I can put on shoes as I continue my travels. With my healthier mind and spirit as my companion. Matthew. Content warning. Suicide. 1 December morning, I made myself a cup of Folgers coffee and peered out the bars of my prison cell. My cellmate had gone to the yard and I had some time alone, watching an armed guard walk past on the catwalk outside. I pondered life. Why didn't anybody tell me it would hurt this much? I asked myself. I was 27 years old, recently sober, and barely two years into a 14-year prison sentence. Things were actually getting better, though it was hard to see at the time. It hadn't always hurt that much. It had started out as fun. Growing up, there was always a case of cheap beer inside the fridge in the garage. It was there mostly for guests since neither of my parents really drank. I was eight years old the first time I stole one of those beers and drank it in the backyard. It was cold and crisp and left my tiny body feeling quite wonderful. I would remember it later. I was part of the just say no generation. My youth was filled with memories of their drug abuse resistance education classes. Nancy Reagan admonishments against drug use and commercials with eggs crackling in a frying pan. I had ideas about what my brain would do on drugs. I was a curious kid with a natural distrust of authority. When I was told not to do something, I tended toward trying it at least once. Just to be sure, my attitude toward drugs was no different. At 12, I tried weed. I'd stolen it from a babysitter and smoked it from a pipe made of tin foil. When none of the terrifying things that were promised me in their classes developed, I came to the erroneous conclusion that my parents, teachers, and first lady had all been lying to me about drugs. Within short order, I was smoking pot with other latchkey kids, spending the hours after school and before our parents came home experimenting with our new form of entertainment. It was actually just fun. At 13 years old, the fun started to subside. I was arrested at a school dance for possession of marijuana and was suspended for a week. I had always been a good kid and a good student. I'd never been in any serious trouble at school. This was a first for me. When I returned to school after my suspension, I swiftly realized that people treated me differently. I got attention from kids that normally wouldn't have paid me any mind. Teachers started treating me like an adult. I'd always been smart but too rough around the edges for the nerdy kids. And I'd always been too nerdy for the jockish crowd. 
Suddenly, I found a role that fit me. The smart kid with a wild streak. If the role didn't fit me well at first, I made